How are you? No one of consequence. I must get used to disappointment. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kill the Cast. My name is Jerry, and today I am sitting down with uh, one of my new favorite commentary people that I've ever listened to. A lot of you know I'm big on commentaries. And we recently did an episode for Horror Coliseum of Orca vs. Alligator, and for that I listened to a commentary for Orca done by this great man who is one of the very few experts in eco-horror. And I am lucky enough to sit down with him. His name is Lee Gambin. Lee, how are you doing? Hey, thank you. That's a lovely intro. I'm good. How are you? I am, I am fantastic today, especially uh, we've been trying to do this for a little bit and, you know, my internet went out and they took two days to fix it. So here we are now. <laughs> Good stuff. And it's crazy times um, at the time of this recording. Crazy times. It is. And hopefully uh, the world will be better after it's done. What do they say? Uh the, the night is darkest before dawn, so hopefully it will get better eventually. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. So, it just... Th- this whole year has been been a wreck, but if there's one good thing to come out of it, it is it is my new friendship with you. We had a, a, a lovely conversation the... What was it? A week ago or so? And we talked for like two hours going through eco-horror and film in general and... Just, you're a wealth of knowledge, and I was like, I have to interview this guy. People need to know about this this guy. He, he's such an expert on eco-horror, but not just that. You're such a well-rounded film historian in general, and I would like people to know, uh, let's kind of first go through just the stuff you've done in horror, and then we'll, we'll show the world... That not only you are an expert in horror, but you're an expert outside of that. And we'll go into some of the stuff you've done outside of horror for film. So, you've written a good couple of books now. Let's let's tell the people about your books, which they can find on Amazon, and they should buy them. So, yeah, cool. I've done a lot of research, as you mentioned in the intro, on animal-centric horror. So, eco-horror or natural horror. Um, it's one of my favourite subgenres, I guess, and it's severely underwritten about or, under dis- uh, or seldom discussed when people sort of do overviews on horror. So it's kind of bizarre that it kind of gets ignored. I mean, we all talk about Jaws and everyone knows the birds, but there's all there's hun- there's all these movies. There's so many of these movies that just sort of get neglected, and the eco horror thing sort of, um, you know, became very popular during the 70s when the environmentalist movement really started to sort of, you know, make itself known sort of outside of an, as an extension of the anti-war movement, um, women's liberation, all the things that was happening during that sort of period. And environmentalism became something that was um, starting to sort of uh, seep into the public consciousness. So these films came out as a response to that. Not all the time, but some of them most definitely did. Um, and so I just thought, oh God, this, this is stuff that, you know, I ate up as a kid and as a teenager. So I really need to sort of focus a lot of my studies and my, my scholarship on this kind of, um, subgenre and this, this realm of, of horror cinema. Um, so that sort of led me to sort of doing, um, you know, basically covering a whole range of things and led me to doing a survey book, uh, on eco horror films entitled Massacred by Mother Nature, exploring the natural horror film, where I sort of discuss different tropes, um, different subsectors of eco horror, um, uh, different films that sort of dealt with the same issue but dealt with it very differently, um, the idea of atomic age animal horror, and then uh, science kind of being an influence in the animals turning on humanity, and then you know, uh, films that were very much geared to, or, sorry, centric on human characters, the human characters and the human interpersonal relationships and how animal attacks kind of reflected the human turmoil. Um, there's a lot of those. So anyway, it was sort of that sort of case study, did some interviews here and there. Um, and then, you know, when I was writing for Fangoria, I was always trying to sort of 
uh, pitch and put in as much eco horror coverage as I could and then wrote essays on certain films that get neglected and under examined and taking different angles from them um, then I was obviously um, upon doing that I was very heavily influenced and interested in dogs in cinema uh, and then sort of uh, took the lead and did a massive monograph on Cujo uh, which sort of became something that you know would start my work in doing a whole bunch of monographs and I've done three now I've done the Cujo book and a book on Christine and a book on the howling um so that's something that I've sort of you know tapped into uh where it's kind of a massive critical uh you know academic assessment and analysis but also an oral history where I interviewed as many people as I could from those three films and then have them in massive chunks in in-depth interviews uh, integrated within the critical analysis and production history. So that's something else. But yeah, animal-centric horror is something I've always loved. But I also love animals in film. So it doesn't sort of just stick to horror. Of course, we're discussing the horror stuff at the moment. But um, animals in movies have always appealed to me as a kid. I always grew up watching a lot of animal-centric films, whether they be, you know, classic Hollywood stuff or weird sort of avant-garde things or just characters who would have a dog or a cat or an animal alongside them, and I would always sort of be attracted to that. I thought it was really sweet, and there was like a nice relationship there. But with the eco-horror, it's when animals turn, and I was always, side, as a kid, always siding with the animals <laughs> to kill off the humans. Um, that's how I am. But yeah, it's really interesting to sort of tap into that and look at that. And then what also extends from that is really uh, my solid interest in animal trainers and wranglers and people who worked with animals and finding the amazing um, uh, correlations between certain films. So a trainer will work on, you know, a multiple amount of movies and then have offshoots and um, uh, uh, assistants who will go off and do other things. Or even in the case of, say, Cujo, you have this generational thing where you have Carl Lewis Miller who worked on Cujo. Now his daughter, the lovely Teresa Ann Miller, is a major animal trainer, most mostly with dogs. Um, so it's really interesting to sort of go into that realm as well. And then also the whole idea of eco horror movies uh, in the way of marketing. That was a really fascinating point there as well. The way that a lot of studios really didn't want to sort of suggest that these movies were about animals and fear that uh, audiences um, uh, wouldn't go see them because they were kind of, you know, considered maybe hokey so they'd always just do the um that sometimes they'd do these poster artwork that would not suggest animals they'd be more subtle and we could talk about that but yeah so basically i don't know if i've answered your question but the animal horror stuff was always appealing and still continues to be and right at this moment i've extended my research and stuff to the point where now i really do want to make a documentary about the ecological horror um, subgenre and going way back, you know, not just from the 70s but beyond before that, um, with certain examples, um, and as well as um, diving into the subsectors that I've actually, I guess, coined um, or you know, f sort of in my research, sort of you know, uh, discovered, I guess, that there are these these um, subsectors of ecological horror that I can go into as we talk, but. But yeah, so that's that's my point at the moment with this sort of stuff because it's something that I've come in and out of. Uh, you know, there was a period where, you know, I wasn't doing anything. But you mentioned in the intro, the very kind, lovely intro you gave me about Orca, the commentary. And I've only done a few animal-centric films uh, uh, as far as commentary gigs go. Um, so that's interesting. So it's sort of interesting to go back and go, oh, shit, awesome, I get to talk about Orca. And I believe Orca was actually my first audio commentary for Umbrella. So that was really cool. That was really fun to do because it was nice to be able to give Orca, you know, the respect it deserves because it's such a beautiful, beautiful film, a poignant, lovely film um, that gets a little bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a uh, Jaws ripoff or Jaws clone thing going on for it but I think it's beyond that I think it's actually it shares more in common with something like Death Wish than Jaws as far as I'm concerned the revenge angle etc but it's such a perfect it's a sweet beautiful lovely film it's a gorgeous looking film and the cast are great and it's got lo it's loaded with uh, archetypes that pop up in a lot of ecological horror films anyway so I could talk on and on about Orca and, and all these movies but that that's my general gist so going in and out of eco horror stuff 
as I've sort of, as my career, the trajectory of my career sort of progressed, the animal horror stuff has always been there as a backbone. Yeah, it, it, it is a very understated genre. There's not as many people covering it. In fact, I was super excited when I was listening to the Orca commentary and you had mentioned you'd done a, a book on eco horror and I was like, well, I have to have that because there's not enough people that cover eco horror. Uh, even in the creature feature genre itself, the eco horror part of that subgenre, which up until I listened to you, I always called the natural creature feature, mm -hmm. dealing with real life uh, animals. Now I'm going to switch to eco horror because it just sounds so much better and has a, a better stance because a lot of these eco horrors are some of the most political movies in horror that don't get taken as serious as they should because like you said people uh sometimes look at it as hokey uh as corny and as a as a lesser genre but so many of them have these great important messages and have these amazing characters like the mother and cujo that is such a a, a movie that following her character development you really feel for her one of the things that um i like to do and my buddy kenneth on the podcast like you we love putting ourselves in the movie to kind of try to figure out how we would react, how we would feel. And that's something that when you do in Cujo, it's just heartbreaking. It just hurts so much to do that because thinking about what you would go through in that it's not, you're not fighting against some uh, good versus evil thing. You're, you're literally just trapped in a hot car because a, animal has con contracted a disease and it is driven it mad and having to deal with that um and orca is is one that i've always maintained is one of my favorite movies in the ego horror it is a top three film for me and we said i said multiple times on our episode when we did it that you're you're right it is it is more like death wish and that it is such a well-made movie but it is absolutely not a Jaws ripoff. It may be a, a Jaws following trend in the instance that it's, yes, there it's a eco-horror creature feature that takes place with a, a sea animal. Mm. But that's basically where it drops from being anything like Jaws. It's such a different movie. It's such a beautiful one that I, I, it's a film I wish people would take more seriously. And one of the things you said that I really find interesting is you're talking about the trainers. Um, two episodes ago, we did Adam Green's Frozen. Mm -hmm. And on the Blu-ray, there is a special feature on there where they actually talk about the the wolf trainers and you get to see the behind the scenes where they're doing the acting and they're giving commands to the wolves and the wolves switching from like this growling thing to bam, they say a command and all of a sudden they're just the peaceful creature as ever it, it's amazing i would actually i would absolutely love to know more about the process of them training them how they go about it all of that because i've got two cats and i can't train them to do anything <laughs> right <laughs> well uh, that's really interesting i need to see that blu-ray of frozen which i actually and i don't really watch a lot of new films or modern films but i actually really enjoyed that film i thought it was terrific um, and the wolves of that are beautiful. It's great. There's that great moment from memory. Correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't seen it for a long time. But where uh, they're feeding on one of the people, and the girl perhaps is running, and the, the wolves let her go because they, they've already they've already been fed. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, that's yes. great, great moment. But it's interesting that I'd love to hear about the wolf training. So the, I've got a story about that because wolves are really really difficult to sort of train. They are. Like, it's interesting, there's someone, I think, there was a meme going around where, um, on social media or something, where lions, uh, it was actually from the California Wolf um, Research Research, research Centre, who is a beautiful group um, in California that basically rehabilitate wolves and other wild um, animals, such as, you know, coyotes and stuff. And they said that in this meme, it was like, you know, the lion gets tamed and is a performer at circuses, but no one can tame or, you know, um, train the wolf. And that's quite interesting. But um, George Toff was a wrangler, uh, animal trainer and wrangler, and he had a wolf sanctuary. 
Um, and a lot of the wolves were actually used in Day of the Animals, which is that wonderful William Girdler film from 77. Uh, but fast forward a couple of years uh, and Joe Dante and um, Rob Bettine, um and Mike Fennell, the producer for The Howling, uh, initially when that film was going ahead, they, they entertained the idea of the werewolves actually being wolves, not um, the makeup design. So people would actually turn into wolves, which is very much akin to a really beautiful 40s film called Cry of the Werewolf, starring Nina Foch, and she's a gypsy woman who turns into a wolf, and she literally turns into a wolf, um, rather than, you know, sprouting hair and fangs and being all Lon Chaney. Um, And so George Toth uh, met up with Rob Bettine and Joe Dante and uh, Mike Fennell, and they went to this ranch, this wolf sanctuary, and what ultimately said, what ultimately changed their mind was the fact that these wolves, you know, leapt up on them, bared fangs, and basically freaked them out. And they're like, okay, we're not doing it. But then also, they, you know, the idea of the werewolves and the howling were meant to be modelled on the wood carvings to make them look like, you know, human esque wolves. Uh, but yeah, so it was it was quite interesting to hear that story um, from Joe Dante when I was doing the book on the howling. That you know, this guy George Toth actually had these wolves and you know lived with them, like which is pretty freaking incredible. Um, and they were used in a bunch of different films, and he worked on a bunch of different films. But mo- most notably for me would be um, Day of the Animals. So, yeah, it's interesting. But, you know, obviously dogs are the descendants of wolves, and, you know, they're trained so beautifully. You mentioned cats, and that's interesting. Uh, Teresa Ann Miller actually trained the cat in Cat's Eye, and she explained to me um, how they got the cat to work. And cats ultimately work for food. Um <laughs> Otherwise, like dogs will work for praise and hugs and kisses and playing and toys and food. But cats are like, nah, just open that can for me, human. Um, so she was training the cat for, for food and stuff and also with whistles and stuff like that. So it was really fascinating to hear that, that the way that different animals work um, and that cats will just do their own thing. And it's just a matter of being patient and waiting um, but yeah, she was, she was really fascinating to hear that story. And I, I believe that's actually on the Cat's Eye, uh, Blu-ray release from Umbrella, which I actually worked on as well. And I, and she's on that in an interview and she talks about the cat training and that was her first job. And that was with her dad, Carl Lewis Miller, um, who of course worked on Cujo and the pack and white dog and a whole bunch of excellent films. But yeah, the training stuff's yeah. really interesting. I was going to say, after our conversation the other day, I actually went and I watched the pack again. Because mm. I'd probably not seen it since I was a kid. And that movie is so beautifully done. Um, and it sets a mood by starting off with a, a scene of, the fa- of a family tying up a dog and leaving a dog on the island, which is later explained by the characters that a lot of these families do that. And it's so heartbreaking that when the dogs actually do start attacking humans, as good as some of these humans are and you want to be on their side, you're just like, no, these dogs are are being mistreated, abused, and left. I can't really blame them. And that's something in eco-horror that it does so well is it really does a lot of times make you side with the animals. It's not like a slasher where you side with the the killer just because oh it's fun there there's such a sadness to a creature feature when it comes to eco horror you always want to take the side of that dog or that cat maybe not the i don't know how many people are going to side with the cat after watching the uncanny they're just going to alex jones more conspiracy about cats trying to rule the world <laughs> but still it, it it's that movie i i rewatched it and by the end of it, I was like, that was amazing, but I'm, I'm so sad. Damn Lee for making me feel this. <laughs> well, so the pack, as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, one of the best examples of revenge fueled eco horror, where you will um, side with the animal. So revenge fueled eco horror is when the animal in question or animals in question have been wronged. Okay, so a Leviathan themed eco horror movie, much like Jaws, you don't really side with the shark. The shark is this kind of monstrous entity that's basically haunting, you know, Brody um, and terrorizing him psychologically. Uh, so there's a lot going on there, and we can talk, you know, under the water for hours about Jaws. But let's talk about the pack. 
Um, so the pack, yes, definitely pits animal against human. And as you say, within the human pack, there are absolutely wonderful people. Like, especially, for instance, Hope Alexander Willis. Like, you know, she's a, a, a lovely character. There's nothing, you know... Um, uh, unlikable about her she's wonderful um even the bb besh character uh but what happens is you side with the dogs because they absolutely as you said have been mistreated they're neglected so what the pack says is you know you uh ignore nature you abuse it it will bite you um and it will come back to destroy you the film does set itself up with that beautiful very poignant sad moment where the you know the family abandon this dog and this dog goes on this journey. So as this sort of, you know, carnage is happening, you see this dog, um, you know, having to sort of uh, join this pack um, of these wild dogs, these feral dogs on Seal Island, um, led by the, the major yellow dog, whose name was Joshua, the dog himself, who played that role, um, by the way. Uh, and what happens at the end is this moment of hope where human and animal can actually reconnect and that great final image where Joe Don Baker you know, earns the dog's trust and he starts licking his hand. Just a beautiful image there sort of sort of captures the idea that there is hope and that, you know, man and dog's um, relationship can actually come back, um, you know, in a, a form of basically the balance again, so the balance of nature can actually be restored. But what I really love about the pack is that, that the dogs and the humans kind of are these two uh, uh, armies, these two, uh, you know, uh, basically they're pitted against each other and they also reflect one another and within the um, human realm of this film of the pack you have a, ma a single man and a single woman who've fallen in love with their own ch their own sons so it's kind of like they've formed their own community their own, they've forged their own pack and then within that you have the other family who are all these kind of you know, uh, misfit groups as well. Um, and then the sort of autistic son who is trying to be set up with the, the sex pot character, um, who's quite... Yeah, that was weird. Mm. I'm not going to lie, that, that was a little weird where I was just like, <laughs> dude, your dad basically told this girl to bang you no matter what. <laughs> yeah. And it's a weird, it's, it's a very weird self -fight. It works because it, it kind of shows how a rich powerful man who only comes to this country area as a relax i'm gonna fish thing while you have him compared to the people that live there that are like all oh, these people don't take it seriously they do they come here and they trash it and they leave you know and he's over here you know using what i assume is his, his money and power in the company to get his son laid and his son wants absolutely nothing to do with it he's so mm. tired of his dad controlling him and trying to do all these things for him and he's more concerned about what's going on with these dogs he's more concerned about his safety mm. than any of that it's very it's, it's a very interesting angle that's in this movie mm. it really is and also i love the way robert Klaus shoots the um attack sequences so you'll have these great slow-mo motions where that that character we're talking about is running through the forest and he's clumsy and he's overweight and he is presented as something that is not equipped and then he cuts to the dogs and they are graceful and they run beautifully i mean if you watch your own dogs run it's one of the most beautiful things to watch because they're just so aware um, a dog will run and their body is just so alive and they know how they know how to maneuver like I watch my own dog running I'm like far out that's, just, that's so remarkable and beautiful and so healthy and 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 graceful and fast and strong and that's the way it's captured in the film that these dogs are so in tune with nature whereas this human is not so it's that kind that what Robert Klaus sort of does is celebrate that and I think it's his most personal film as well. He worked with um, Bruce Lee, wrote a book on Bruce Lee, was good friends with Bruce Lee. And, you know, the, the work he did with Bruce Lee really does celebrate Bruce Lee's own elegance and grace as a martial artist and as, some, you know, this amazing man of great physical prowess. And I think that's captured here in the pack as well. You get to see the athleticism and, and brilliance of dogs. Um, in comparison to humans who, if they are attacked by dogs, are pretty fucked. Like, honestly, like, 
you know, this is a pack of dogs who will just rip your throat out because they're hungry. And that's essentially what it's about as well, this whole idea of survival. And there's some fantastic imagery where, like, at the end where Joe Dunbaker is grabbing that mattress frame and, like, pushing it to the Joshua dog um, and it looks like he's being trapped, which is really beautiful imagery, which kind of reflects, you know, um, Rod Taylor in the birds being imprisoned by the birds. So these animals have now caged the human. Uh, just really cool stuff like that. Um, the beautiful score in the pack. Uh, it's got this really graphic, um, you know, ugliness to it as well. Um, you know, the old man being slaughtered. Also the idea of the dogs who are actually sided with the humans, who aren't feral. Um, you know, John Do Joe Don Baker's dog and, I, and the old man's dog, Jar Jar. You know, they're still uh, um, socialised to be with the people, with the human pack. So that kind of, the politics there is really interesting, that they, you know, they're not siding with the, the, the feral dogs. So I really enjoy, I think the pack is just a remarkable example of revenge field horror films and also such a good fable, a good, um, you know, um, a cautionary tale of not um, being an asshole to animals um, and respecting animals because this can happen. And I think... It's one of the films that is very much treated seriously by audiences. Um, and I think going back to that topic, the whole idea of people sort of taking eco horror movies seriously, quote unquote, is because I fear that a lot of people see horror movies and they have to be scared of the, of the threat. And it's like, can't you just sit there and enjoy a film? Like, you know, so people, if they're not scared of, you know, uh, I don't know, spiders, they're not going to be scared of films like, Kingdom of the Spiders or Arachnophobia, they're not going to work for them. Whereas um, if they are, then it might work for them. But I don't understand that idea. People have always asked me, and I, I cringe when I hear it, you know, what films scare you? And I go, none, no horror films. Generally, horror films don't scare me. I'm, I'm not for. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to jump in on this one. Uh, if you're in a lot of horror Facebook groups, you will always see people go, I need a movie that scares me. Nothing mm. scares me no more. And I'm like, that's because you're an adult and your imagination <laughs> died when you were a child. Right. So you're not scared of the shadows. You're not scared of of a killer or a, you know, a, a monster anymore. That's what happens when you grow up. The only thing you can really do now is put yourself in that position and think about how you would react. Now you have to watch the film and do either one of two things just sit back and enjoy it mm. or analyze it and judge how you would react what would have you have done in that situation and then after you do that you go well what if i even thought about doing that <laughs> in this moment of tension and anxiety uh compared to me sitting on my couch thinking about oh i would do this mm. no you would be eaten by the dogs right <laughs> that's what's going to happen here because you much like the 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 sun running through the woods or sitting on your couch. You're not going, these dogs are going to rip you apart. The pack is, is filmed like the dogs are filmed. Like you're filming Bruce Lee in a fight scene. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I, I want so bad. I've got to hunt down a Blu-ray of the pack that has special features or a DVD or whatever. Cause I really want to see some behind the scenes stuff. I would There's love nothing. to see. There's nothing, and I'll be, and I'll, 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 I'll put this out there. I'll be a bit annoyed if I'm not <laughs> at least asked to do something on that release. <laughs> but yeah, no, Warner Archives have released a beautiful Blu-ray print of it on DVD. I don't think it's had a Blu-ray, um, just the DVD that is in circulation, uh, like well, a like a print on yeah. demand, and it looks terrific. It's remastered. It looks great and sounds great. Um, but I just want to go okay. into some of the stuff in there as well, just before we move on. But the pack also has this great um, uh, stuff happening in it that a lot of eco-horror movies do, especially when there's a multiple amount of characters who have to survive. And what happens is there's that cabin fever moment where they all turn on each other. When B.B. Besh starts screaming at Joe Don Baker, it's chilling uh, when her husband's dying. Um, and it's just so good that, that the human characters start to turn on each other. And also the funeral procession, these, these humans who are basically stripped of their humanity and forced to sort of be, you know, warriors um, pitted against these dogs, these killer dogs. And it's just, it's extraordinary. And it's so, and it builds and the tension is really 
there. And I remember I've interviewed Hope Alexander Willis about it and she's amazing. And she was saying this film was a ama- It was a success for Warner Brothers. The only thing um, really going against it, well, you know, there were other films of the year that were very successful, but obviously freaking Star Wars happened in the same year. So, you know, a lot of films kind of fell on the sidelines because Star Wars hit. But she said the pack was really good. It did really good work for Warner Brothers. Um, it was also called, I don't know if you know this, but it was called The Long Dark Night. Um, and that was the alternative title uh, to sort of, you know, hide the fact that it was about killer dogs. And going back to what I said earlier about the poster art, this is really interesting. The, the original poster art was the outline shaping, this sort of stencil-like thing of the dogs in a, in a formation, which I've got a t-shirt printed of, actually, which is really cool. And the tagline was, um, they're not pets anymore, which is very cool, but quite exploitation, sort of, um, you know, that kind of sensibility. But the alternative poster, the Long Dark Night, um, was basically a piece of note, like a, a, a ripped note, which had scribbling on it, you know, help, please help us, we're trapped, blah, blah, blah. And it's sort of stuck on this dirt, um, and you can see, like, leaves and, you know, grime, and that was it. So it's like, what is this movie? Is it a hostage film? Is it, like, Deliverance? Like, what is, what's going on here? So it didn't at all scream killer dogs. So it was the way Warner Brothers sort of marketed so people would go, oh, it's, if it's a killer dog movie, I might not be interested, but this looks intriguing. So that, that was something that happened um, with these films uh, sometimes. So it was, so yeah, anyway, regardless of how it was pitched, ultimately the film is incredibly effective. Every element of it, from the editing to the performances, I mean, you've got R.G. Armstrong and Joe Don Baker and B.B. Besh and Hope Alexander and all these great stars, um, and then also the score and the animal training, so that was all Carl Lewis Miller. Also, Carl Lewis Miller, um, if you notice in the pack, a lot of the dogs are snarling. Um, that's from a little a thing called a bit, which is basically this sort of food-based um, uh, mouthpiece that would sit under the dog's lips. Uh, it'd be like a beef chew, so the dog could actually eat it. Um, and they'd wear it and they'd be snarling because the dogs are always happy and cheery. Um, so you'd see wa- tails wagging. You'll see a lot of tails um, uh, weighted down and tied down because they were always happy. <laughs> because the way Carl Lewis Miller trained his dogs was to entice play. Um, and the way if you edit dogs um, playing like with great fervor and they're all getting crazy and you edit it so it looks like they're attacking you, that's the master sort of, you know, uh, magic of film, I guess, the idea of um, the dogs looking like they're actually tearing at your throat when they just want their toys. So Carl Lewis Miller would actually um, make sure the dogs were always having fun and he'd get on all fours and play with them and get them to that, that point of frenzy where they just wanted to play. And most of his dogs were his own They on the property. And I think Teresa Ann Miller still actually lives there. And the dogs were all, um, uh, a lot of them were shelter dogs, rescue dogs, and they all lived with him, and he looked after them. And, you know, for Cujo, for instance, I think there were like nine St. Bernards that lived with them, and that all did different jobs for the film. Um, so in the pack, there were all these different dogs that he trained and worked with. And his career is really interesting. He started um, as a security uh, guard um, for an airport, and he used to get bored doing it. And he goes, you know what would make my nights better? If I had a dog, a security dog. And so they gave him one, the airport gave him one, and it was a German Shepherd, and he trained him and started to get him to do tricks, and he thought, this is, I've got a natural knack for this, so he started to do films. Um, and he worked with all different kinds of dogs, all breeds. Um, one of the dogs was Scruffy from uh, Mrs. Miniver, the ghost of Mrs. Miniver, a uh, little terrier. So, you know, all these different dog breeds, and then, then he's, you know, he was good friends with people like Frank and Juanita, uh, when he, when Juanita Inn, who did Benji stuff with Higgins, the dog, and Benjean, his daughter. So all this kind of community of dog <laughs> training was there. And the pack kind of really sort of, you know, celebrates that. And I think it's a really strong, positive um, representation of dogs in film as well, because it sort of says dogs deserve respect. Uh, I, re- I, I really I enjoy that. The other film that I love from the year before would be Dogs. Um, which is a fantastic film, um, which is actually about uh, dogs packing up because of 
uh, secret government experiment involving pheromones. And, you know, it's all these different breeds of dogs and they terrorise a university campus. And it's fabulous, wonderful film as well. And it's got this gorgeous lighting, you know, Southern California looking beautiful and sun-kissed, the orange hues. And just these dogs going crazy and all breeds. It's always really nice to see, like, a big English sheepdog with a Doberman and a little terrier and a um, Dalmatian. And, you know, all these breeds just packing together and fucking fucking up humans. Really good fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... So, I gotta ask, it watched the pack with your dog. Yeah. Do you worry a little bit? Do you <laughs> look at him and just go, I will always treat you nice, don't you worry? <laughs> well, it's interesting, like, to, well, I mean, dogs um, pick up sounds and stuff. Mine loves movies, and he'll actually pick up sounds on dog barking, and he can pick up, he can actually distinguish between real dog barking and foley like human doing voices so if you watch cujo there's a lot of um frank welker barking doing his work um and then there's a lot of actual real dogs um the sound people you know got a lot of real samples and my dog buddy can actually distinguish it like you see him prick his ears up when it's a real dog but if it's frank welker he knows and he ignores it <laughs> um with the pack it's the same thing so he can sense the sound um, and, uh, it's interesting, he, he'll be able to, he, he can pick up images of dogs running and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's cute. But, yeah, dog, look, they're my people. <laughs> they're just the best. For sure, uh, if you had, if you were in one of these movies and you were going to be killed and eaten by a dog, is there a certain breed that you want to be taken down <laughs> in film? I, I wouldn't mind. I'd be happy to... You know, let them let them chomp away. I, w I would like to be killed by a cocker spaniel. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> it's it would be a, the most adorable, and plus, if the blood got all over the ears, it would just be oh. so cute. People would be rooting for that cocker spaniel to eat me. And I'd be okay with it. Have you ever seen uh, the 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 Ghana poster for Cujo? No. Oh, look it up, and then you'll see a cocker spaniel. So it's this. And you, you, you're familiar with the Ghana posters, but the Cujo, yes. the Cujo one's hilarious. I'll let, I'll let you and your listeners look that up. It, it's pretty funny. You heard them, folks. We have to look that up. So you're doing the upcoming commentary that will be on the Scream Factory release for Orca. And that popped back into my mind because of you saying uh, having a human actor do the sounds for the animal and in, in orca there there's a, a human actor doing the sounds for the killer whale which is always kind of weird to me because i'm like can't you just get actual animal sounds why do you need to have a um a human actor doing these sounds yeah uh, i guess that was kind of weird i guess for specifics um that commentary though is the, the same one i did for uh umbrella so it's been ported over which good on screen factory for, for that because one i have the umbrella release of orca absolutely beautiful love that commentary and uh, i know for a lot of people who don't either don't buy uh foreign companies movies releases because they're afraid of region locking or, or whatever uh, it's great to see when the movie comes out in another, uh, in your homeland, for instance, for me in the U.S., it is absolutely fantastic to see them bring over special features, and I'm super stoked that your commentary is going to be on the Scream Factory, mostly because I want more people to hear your, your comment. It's so good, and I'm so proud of Scream Factory for hooking up the people, especially for all these people with Scream Factory love, because uh, I know a lot of people that are super into Scream Factory. Mm. Um, and I, I, Orca is, is a movie that I definitely feel needs more love. So good on Scream Factory for getting uh, the man who should be doing every eco-horror commentary <laughs> track. Oh, thank you. I'll Honestly, I... Sorry, go on. Go ahead. Oh, um, I, uh, I was just going to uh, praise you more. 
<laughs> Thank you. It's, that's much appreciated. I really love doing the orca commentary um, for a number of reasons. Um, also, one of the reasons is I have Maltese heritage, and um, the last act of Malta, uh, orca is shot in Malta. Um, so it was really nice to actually talk about Malta, something I've never done, really, in my in my life, like really sort of talked about being Maltese. But uh, it was really cool to sort of riff on Malta as a place of, um, uh, you know, filmmaking, where lots of films have been shot there. Uh, most notably, the main one that gets talked about a lot is Altman's, um, Robert Altman's uh, musical adaptation of Popeye with Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall, which, you know, was a notoriously you know, um, plagued by a lot of issues production. Um, uh, but the Popeye village actually still is in existence on Mal in Malta. Um, so that's pretty cool. So it was nice to riff on Malta and Malta's history with film and with American cinema. And also just to talk about everything to do with Orca. Um, there's just, there's, you know, you can't sort of praise it enough. It is much like the pack, one of my favorites. Um, and, it is something that really does set up archetypal roles um, that really do pop up a lot in a lot of eco-horror movies, especially eco-horror films of the 70s. So I'll talk you through some of them. So one would be the Richard Harris character, which is the sort of haunted uh, rogue loner type um, who's usually haunted by past trauma or past experience and is pitted against this animal. Um, or animals. Um, then you have the sympathetic, what I call the sympathetic specialist um, archetype, who is usually most most notably a woman, um, who is a scholar or an expert in the animal in question, um, and has compassion and sympathy for the animal. Uh, and then you have the sort of archetype of the sort of mystic um, uh, Native American Indian or indigenous person, they sometimes pop up in these films. Uh, you have sort of the quote-unquote innocent victim or the bystander victim, and Bo Derek sort of represents that in this film. Um, and, you know, so there's all this sort of stuff going on there. As far as it's sort of likened to Jaws, one of my main um, reasonings as to why it would be considered a Jaws uh, clone or sort of taking or borrowing from Jaws um, like you said earlier, obviously, it's a sea-based creature, etc. But ultimately, it does have the Isbin enemy of the people element running through it, which Jaws essentially, you know, has as well as its lifeblood, where the townsfolk are all affected by um, Richard Harris's mistake um, because the whale, the orca, has, you know, destroyed the electricity and set fires and the fish are all sort of, you know, disappearing so there's no fishing community so the whole idea of the isbin story of enemy of the people is interplayed in um orca which is in jaws as well but um also the final act you know sort of setting out to take on the whale but yeah it's a remarkably important beautiful um film and a perfect um entry in the eco horror world and it's possibly my favorite of the sort of um, oceanic um, eco horrors, uh, and it sort of uses, you know, locales beautifully, you know, because, uh, you know, the idea of the whale actually destroying land, that's incredible, you know, because with oceanic animals, they're kind of, you know, in the ocean, so you have to venture to them in order to be, you know, damaged. But this whale, <laughs> with his incredible intelligence, manages to fuck up, you know, people happily living in their, you know, comfortable homes. So I think that's really interesting. It's a really interesting take. And that script um, went through different drafts. And one of the writers on it was Robert Town, uh, you know, who worked on a whole bunch of stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really sharp script and also really moving. Uh, you know, once the whale kills Richard Harris, he kind of has no purpose and he pretty much suicides he's under the ice and you know he can't get out to breathe and it's like this these two you know lonely male characters who've lost their 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 wife and child in their pasts uh both die at the same time it's 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 actually you know really really nice nicely written conceived piece it is i i adore this movie it it's 
I, it, it hits you with a gut punch early on, and then it ends on this beautiful sad note. Uh, the music in the movie, is yeah, fantastic. I was gonna say, of oh man, it's good. Yeah. Um. So speaking of commentary, how how did you come about getting into the commentary business? How how did how did that happen? Yeah. Um. It comes from just constantly working and writing. So my so I'll just sort of give you a very quick nutshell backtrack. Um, I started with zines. I started with um, contributing essays and pieces for different people, uh, for magazines. And then I got a friggin' awesome job at Fangoria, which really opened all doors. Um, and that was terrific. And so doing Fangoria sort of opened up um, opportunities. And then I started writing, uh, did the book, the first book, and then... Um, would contribute here and there to different pieces, build up a big sort of bank of interviews. Um, and then eventually, after a few books more, I think, later, and a few heaps of essays and maybe even like, I think, 10 or so years at Fangoria, as well as writing for other periodicals, mostly horror ones. Um, I started... And then, you know, writing a book on 70s film musicals and then doing a whole bunch of different stuff here and there in different genres. I then um, was asked by the lovely Heather Buckley, God bless her, um, who is a producer of a bunch of features for Kino Lorba, if I would be interested in doing commentaries. And I said, oh my God, yes, absolutely. But before I started working with um, Kino Lorba, um, I was in touch with Umbrella here and they got me to um, organize certain stuff for um, their releases of three ecological horror films and that was through Simon Sherry who was uh, who's the head designer of Umbrella um, and he said what can you muster up and I said look I reckon a panel discussion on Dark Age, Long Weekend and Razorback which were all getting their releases would be really cool and I can gather a bunch of people we can talk so I collected Emma Westwood, um, who's a great... These are all Melbourne people. Emma Westwood, who's written a book on The Fly. Um, she's written a book recently on Seconds, a Frankenheimer film. A whole bunch of horror stuff she's done, um, and all genre. Alexandra Halla nicholas another in excellent writer and critic, who does a lot of stuff. She did a book on Rape Revenge. She did a book on Ms. 45. She did a book on uh, found footage horror, blah, blah, blah. Amazing woman. And Sally Christie, who was who is part of my... Film uh, Collective Cinemaniacs, um, who is doing a bunch of stuff and has done some stuff. And so we did these um, panel discussions on these films that Umbrella were releasing, um, Long Weekend, Dark Age and Razorback, three iconic Australian eco-horror movies. <clears throat> and then Leon from Umbrella was suggesting that we're uh, so he, so he said that they're doing Orca. They go, fuck, I need to be involved with Orca. Let me do a commentary, please. And he goes, yep. So I actually um, went to the Umbrella place. I didn't know I could just do it from home. <laughs> this is how green I was. And I went to the Umbrella offices and recorded the Orca commentary there. And that's my first gig. And then um, Heather Buckley uh, introduced me to the excellent team at Kino Lorba. And I started there, and then it branched off from there. So then I got work with Arrow, and work with um, Shout Factory, and Scream Factory, and um, uh, uh, Indicator. And yeah, it's just been ongoing, and it's just the best. I bloody love it. And, uh, you know, just recently did a job for Sony Columbia, which was really awesome. And yeah, so it's just sort of building from there. So I've done quite a fair few now, like... And it's just the best. I'm really appreciative of the gigs and I, I love the work and it's all genres that I'm doing in all eras. So it's, you know, I'll be going from the thirties, you know, um, gangster picture to, you know, uh, made for TV movie from the seventies to like a, you know, uh, eco horror film to a musical to a Western. And it's just, it's brilliant. I love it. Cause I love all films. Yeah. It, it's, it's very interesting. I, I'm as a huge commentary fan. I've always been very interested in the the making of a commentary um, mm -hmm. from the research, right? Like I feel like do 
you can't just go. I mean, I, some people may be able to, but you don't want to just go in there, sit down, hit record, and start talking. Like you need to have notes. You need to have it paced out. You need to have that outline for when it happens during the movie, like almost timed out. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when you do your commentaries, are they done in one take? Are you so well prepared you do it in one take, or is it a multiple take and then edited together kind of thing? It varies. So sometimes it would be one take. Funnily enough, sometimes it won't. But the, I'll just sort of talk you through how I work. Um, I do a lot of the research, obviously, um, and then I do um, a scene-by-scene outline. So I'll be watching the movie over and over again, and then I'll do a scene-by-scene breakdown and then chuck in all my notes, pack in all my notes at each scene. But then not feel trapped by the scene itself. So, for instance, if the scene happens and it's gone, but I want to refer back to it, I'm going to just reference it again because... There's, you know, one scene could really dictate you doing, you know, two pages of content. So you, you've got to have to let it go and just jump back. Secondly, I always, 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 always want to um, have a nice marriage, a nice combination of critical analysis as well as production history. It's really vitally important to, to do both, I think. Um, it's really important to have the production history. So you know, learning as much as you can about the history of the film, the ca- the actors, the stars, the production history, the va- the um the people who worked on on the crew, but then also have that combined with uh, you know a uh, sort of you know idiosyncratic point of view or a critical analysis or a um, academic angle or um you know just sort of uh, a different take on things. So you could you know bring in certain um subject matter and relate it to what's going on on screen etc but then to have that combo also if you're doing a film that's kind of you know from the 70s onwards chances are people who worked on it are alive so i tend to sort of branch out and try and reach people uh, i remember when i did night of the lepus no one from that movie ultimately is alive except i found this wonderful man named jack n young who was actually the location manager on that film, but he um, was a stuntman for years in heaps of westerns, and he and I stayed friends until his death um, a few years ago, and he would send me photos galore of him with Lee Marvin, of him with John Wayne, of him with Olivia de Havilland on the locations of things. I was like, oh my God, this is just film history. This guy needs to do a fucking book. But he was a location manager on uh, William Claxton, um, Night of the Leap, was the Killer Rabbit movie. And he told me stories about that and about the rabbits and about, you know, uh, what the rabbits got up to. So I got to share that in the commentary and it felt really nice to do that because it was giving a voice to people who worked on the film. Um, so I, I'm a big champion of reaching out to people who worked on the film. I really, really am. I think it's really important. Um, and also, yeah, obviously just doing the research and finding different angles. Um, so, you know, and also I love, and a lot of people probably don't love it, but I like it, um, uh, doing sort of, um, um, uh, uh, I guess finding connections to other films and sort of bringing it all to the get together. So like, say for instance, I did a commentary on, um, uh, you know, the reincarnation of Peter Proud. So I discussed reincarnation in cinema. And so I brought up things like, you know, uh, everything from The Mummy, um, the Karloff film, all the way through to the Vincent Minnelli musical with Barbara Streisand on Eclito You Can See Forever, to um, the Benji reincarnation movie, Oh Heavenly Dog. So like, you know, bringing all that in there. So it was like, you know, here's a little a little sub sidebar on reincarnation in movies. Uh, when I did Orca, I was, did talk about whales in film, um, from memory, um, you know, uh, whether it was Moby Dick or, you know, whatever it was. So it's nice to have that kind of thing as well. So you want to sort of pack it in with as much as you can, um, and then talk about, you know, genre stuff and yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's a really, it's amazing. And I sit with the film for say two to three weeks and just sort of work through it and then write my notes and then go for it. Um, and then sometimes I script it and sometimes I don't. Mostly I do big bullet points with chunks and slabs of my writing. Um, and then I riff. Um, and it's sort of a matter of just sort of staying on, on target and not running off on too many tangents. And sometimes I'm guilty of that. But you know, that, <laughs> that's Wait. what happens. 
anyone who does anything like podcasting or commentary, we all know the pitfall of tangents. Yeah. That that gets us all. But you are right. I love um, learning a connection from a film to another. I was listening to the commentary for Pumpkinhead. Uh-huh. And uh, there's a dog in Pumpkinhead, and they actually talk about, oh, this dog, some of you might recognize him. It's the same dog that's in Gremlins. Oh. And I was just like, holy shit, really? That is amazing. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of commentaries in general. And you kind of hit of all hit pretty much everything I'm looking for in a commentary. I want to know production stuff uh, from before it was made, how it got made, how it was on the set, behind the scenes, stuff like that. Um, I do like l- learning uh, a history of the people involved. Though sometimes I feel like uh, the commentaries go a little too far with that. Um, And some of them I've I've listened to, like, some will do, like, the brief history. Oh, they started off in this, made it big with this, uh, became popular doing this. But some of them will just sit there and go, and he was in this movie, this movie, this movie, and just, like, name off 20 movies in a row. And I'm like, that doesn't help me. I can go to IMDb for that. Yeah, right. (laughs) I, like... Hit the, hit the good bullet points, but move on. Um, I do love a critical analysis. I, I love when uh, things are pointed out to me. I know in our first conversation, uh, we were talking about Alligator, and you pointed out something that you learned from the director that I never thought of, and it has to deal with the wedding scene, which when we did our um, Orca versus Alligator, we talked about the wedding scene, we all kind of was like, the wedding scene feels a little uh, shoved in there. Um, but now, knowing the context from what you told me, it doesn't feel shoved in. It feels a perfectly evolved scene. Mm. So I would love for you to tell the people, because I didn't know about it, and I feel like if I didn't know it about Alligator, most of the fans of the show are not going to know. So can you tell me about... Um, what you learned from the director about that scene and about uh, th- this kind of secret meaning behind Alligator. So, not so much the director, that was the excellent Lewis Teague, who is terrific and incredibly smart, but this is going to, this is the credit would be to um, the, the writer, John Sayles. So, okay. Allig- Alligator, that's okay, Alligator um, is a response to crisis. So, and class. It's a full-on film about um, class resentment and class struggle and the class system. So the reason why it escalates to the wedding is that's when people start to pay attention. So basically, you've got this mutation, this mutated alligator, who's first victims, who starts off, you know, sort of attacking people from the ghetto, then it moves to the working classes, then the middle class, and then finally the wealthy. And that when people start to react and realize, oh, fuck, this is real. So what John Sayles, um, who is a genius, one of the best writers ever, um, is saying is that the world, um, the American class system, does not respond to crisis unless it attacks the rich. So this comes out in 1980. The AIDS crisis is happening, sort of starting to birth at the same time. And it's a really cool, palpable commentary on that because what happens with the AIDS crisis, and Ronald Reagan also, by the way, comes into power at that period as well, around that time in 81, I believe. So what happens is um, the AIDS crisis happens. Uh, You know, gay men are getting it, people who are intravenous drug users, sex workers are getting it, you know, and, you know, a lot of the sort of ghetto people, dwellers and people in low socioeconomic uh, economic sort of subsectors are getting it and no one's kind of caring no people are like oh it doesn't matter and then finally you know wealthy white straight men probably start to get it and people start to react and think oh fuck is this actually real is it this is a real disease shock horror you know it's this whole thing where people kind of have that um, you know, the conservatives sort of tr- trying to keep things under the carpet, sweep things under the carpet. And John Sayles comments on that sort of aspect in his excellent, biting, sharp, socially aware commentary in the script for Alligator. So the Alligator, to escalate its destruction, its path of destruction to the, the fuckers who actually caused him to be a mutation, is a really, really smart political statement. And Sayles is one of those master writers who injects all of his scripts be they horror or not, 
with social commentary. If you look at Piranha, which he also wrote, that's got a really nice response to the way the media handled, you know, crisis such as the Vietnam War. Um, it's got a whole bunch of stuff about secret government agents, agencies. Um, you look at The Howling, another script um, penned by John Sayles, as well as Terence H. H. Wickmans as well. But um, John Sayles injects it with this whole idea of, you know, being scared and not trusting um, institutions, the role of the media again, um, the power of perception, um, the power of misperception, and also um, the Estian thing, the whole thing about you know, self-awareness and self-help and how that's something that, you know, is actually quite fucked and, you know, <laughs> leads people to becoming werewolves and celebrating this bestial state, which is actually destructive and violent. But yeah, really, really smart writer. And Alligator is one of those really, really socially aware political eco-horror movies. And as you said earlier, eco-horror films are absolutely political. So many of them are. And Alligator is definitely one of them. And that also, once again... You know, uh, John Sayles plots it with great archetypes. You know, Robert Forster's character, uh, Robin Riker, once again, another sympathetic specialist. Um, and I love that he gives her a backstory as a little girl who um, has a little alligator that the father flushes down the toilet, who ends up being the, the killer. But really smart stuff and funny. Like, it's got really cool, funny moments. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, absolutely, there's this whole class... Uh, uh, breakdown in that film and it's so good it's so well written and I would love to see deleted scenes from it actually um, that are around um, Lewis Teague again great director Alligator would lead him to take on Cujo uh, we all know the story because Stephen King loved Alligator and thought he'd be a good director for it and Peter Medak had just been let go from the project of Cujo so Teague came in and stepped in and did wonders with that as well. So yeah, really, really cool stuff. There's a really amazing period there in that in that world of um, you know horror movies, the late seventies, early eighties, where things were just you know smarter than what people thought. You know, and I think rewatching them from the unenlightened, like if people don't care about these movies, rewatch watch them, and you'll see this real intelligence. Yeah, especially now that, that you're an adult, you can change your view from watching it as, you know, the the animal on the loose film to actually see these economical, uh, not economical, well, economical in some sense, but the, the ego messages that are in these movies, you know, I, I go from being a kid and watching Frogs and Empire of the Ants mm -hmm. and just going, yeah, creatures fuck shit up, to being an adult and really understanding how humans are affecting nature and what would happen if you know our crimes against nature came back to bite us in the ass in a physical form uh it, it's a wonderful thing and i think the subgenre itself really needs more love and you're the band doing it you have a uh documentary that is that is very early in 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 the works um, but when I saw that, I, I got so giddy. I, I love horror documentaries. I, I love those kind of stuff. I, one of my favorite ones is, uh, machete wielding maidens about, uh, the making of horror movies in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that, oh my God, an eco horror one is coming out and I was looking at it and I'm like, oh man, it is going back and it is going before the 70s, it is It is really going to cover everything in such an expansive way. You're really going to get to learn about the beginning and the birth of this subgenre. So if we could, let's take a minute to, to let you kind of give the people an idea of what you hope to do with this documentary. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to um, pretty much sort of detail the history of the genre. So there's a bunch of different things I want to sort of deal with. Um, and I've teamed up with um, John Campopiono, who is a great filmmaker. He did the documentary about Pet Cemetery, um, And he's in post now for the Pennywise documentary, so the history of It, um, which I was a talking... Oh, yeah, about. I'm really excited about that one. Yeah, which looks fantastic. I saw a, a snippet of it. It looks great. Um, and, yeah, great filmmaker. And also um, a friend here, Therese Matashenki, and she... 
um, runs the Cinemaniacs Collective with me here. So she's been working on this documentary as well. Um, hopefully we'll have some news very soon. Um, there's lots of talks with certain people, but yeah, it's very, very, very early days, very embryonic. However, the structure is pretty much there. Um, so basically what I want to do is talk about the, the wave of environmentalism and environmentalist awareness and the social and political um, background and backdrop to these movies. I want to talk about films that predate the birds. So I want to talk about films that have animals as a featured threat that aren't, um, that, sorry, that precede the birds. I also want, in, in, in that regard also, talk about movies where animal, where how animals are actually represented in films outside of ecological horror movies. So going back to, if you look at like, um, it's really interesting, it's fascinating. If you look at like the 60s, for instance, there's a whole lot of movies about animals as clowns. Um, Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion, Fearless Fagin, um, this is 50s and 60s, sorry, you get a shaggy dog. You get all these movies where animals are kind of funny clowns and generally the best friend of sort of a misfit. And so they're, they're friendly and they're, they're part of the family and they're also these kind of comical buffoons. And so what Eco Horror does is sort of reclaim it and say, no, 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 we're not here to, <laughs> to pander to you, human. We're here to kill you because you fucked us over. <laughs> so it's interesting to see that. So I want to talk about that in, retro in regards to Eco Horror. Um, and then I want to really, really dive into the subsectors of eco horror. So I've mentioned two before, which is one is the revenge fueled ecological horror movie. So animals who are wronged who get their revenge. The second one I mentioned earlier was the um, the uh, Leviathan style eco horror. So this is where animals are basically unfeeling, unrelenting, uh, monstrous creatures um, who will kill, and there's there's nothing stopping them, and there's nothing that's turned them against they're just they're naturally there to kill um and it's their in their instinct um and then there's others so the other subsectors i've got are what i call the human help branch of eco horror films so this is where you think of films like willard kiss of the tarantula jennifer um black zoo um ben a whole bunch of the the the, the killer bees with gloria swanson these are movies where humans who were usually ostracized and alienated or picked on or, you know, bizarre or different, train animals to do their bidding. And they, they deal with their social problems through animals killing for them. So there's that. There's also um, the character-centric or uh, character-driven eco-horror movies where basically it's, about, it's an interpersonal thing. So it's about people and their response to animals and how the uh, the animals that are in question of killing um is a reflection or an extension of these people um for instance if you think of something like the birds when tippy hedron enters bodega bay birds start to attack so there's kind of um subliminal this sort of you know subliminal um uh, subtext going on where she's brought in this this chaos and generally that's another trope as well there's usually an outsider who comes into the environment and upsets the natural order that even happens in frogs sam elliott's character comes in to this family and things start to erupt and things start to emerge and it's kind of like a liberation for the animals uh and then there's the um the the one that's probably the most dominant and popular and that would be the science influence eco horror because that dates back to things like the 50s where you've got things like tarantula and beginning of the end where the giant bug movies sort of exploded all the way through to the 70s stuff where you th think of things like Kingdom of the Spiders and and um, Night of the Lepus and you mentioned Empire of the Ants and stuff where, you know, pollutants and, um, you know, uh, nuclear energy, etc. and radiation uh, make turn transform animals from a natural state to, you know, something mutant and monstrous. So there's a whole different sub... There's all those subsectors. I do want to do a sidebar on trainers... Um, and also animal stars, certain animals that actually had careers outside of the one film they did. Um, uh, and then um, I do want to talk about the stock characters that I mentioned, because that's a major deal. Um, and then I also want to, of course, and we've already got like 20 people confirmed, to have interviews. So interviews with um, cast and crew. Ultimately, it would be fantastic to have, say, um, one person for representing, say, about 30 of the movies. So that would be fantastic. 
And if there's doubles, that's fine. Awesome. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, we've got a whole bunch of people lined up. And like I said, I've been working in this field forever. So I've built um, connections and friendships, you know. I'm, you know, very close to people like Dee Wallace and stuff like that. So it's this whole thing where these people, you know, are so beautiful and so loving and so loyal and so generous with time and, and their words and their energy that they'll do this stuff. And it's just fucking awesome. So... Getting interviews, not only just um, people who worked in the films, but scholars. And just to have a documentary that's swift and strong and dynamic with lots of clips, lots of stills, lots of production history stuff, lots of critical analysis stuff to have that nice marriage and to treat it seriously so it's not a flappy one. And it's, you know, engaging and entertaining and fun, but also, you know, deep. Um, so yeah, uh, and you know, we've looked at a lot of, eco uh, sorry, uh, a lot of horror documentary and film documentaries and I'm at, like you, I'm a big fan. I eat them up and there's been a few that have been kind of models for me, like, you know, showing Therese and John saying, this is what I reckon this would look like and feel like. I just think that would be, you know, that's a great way to approach a documentary. So it's very early embryonic days, but it's, it's going to get there. I'm determined. <laughs> Yeah, and like I said, I cannot wait for it. I love this stuff. I eat this stuff up. I'm so glad that there is someone spearheading uh, one of the just... A, a genre that's so close to my heart, yet is so hard to really find good information on. Mm -hmm. So compared to a lot of other... Like, you can find a million things on slashers. You can find a million things on, like, the Universal uh, Monsters, which I, I, I do love. Um, but there's not a, there's not enough when it comes to ego horror. If it, when you were talking about the, the pre-70s stuff, uh, I can't think of the movie off my head. You might come up with it. Um, there's a scene. It's a black and white movie. Pro I want to say it's from the 40s. Um, it might have even been a Luton film where... Um, there's a mother and she's like cooking and uh on the news that's playing she kind of hears something about like i think it was a panther that escaped the yeah the leopard man the leopard man yeah and the daughter runs to the door and she's banging on let me in let me mm -hmm. in and the mother's kind of like oh whatever and then when she starts screaming the mother's like oh I, i'll help you baby i'll help you baby and by the time she gets to the door she hears this thud and then blood come under the door and it to me is one of the one of the greatest scenes in horror mm. um and stunning film uh, yeah so that so that's the, the leopard man and that um has just had a beautiful release on blu-ray and i think um uh william friedkin actually is, does one of the commentaries on it because he really you know is a big fan of that film oh wow yeah i've gotta i've gotta look that uh, but do you know what company put it out? I've got it right next to me. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's right here. Um, it is a Leopard Man from... Oh, Scream Factory. Scream Factory. Okay, I'll be picking that up. Scream Factory has been been doing really good work with the movies they've been put out. Especially for... Uh, I was so excited last year when they put... Um, the Black Cat, starring Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, mm -hmm. uh, on Blu-ray. That's one of um, my favorite movies ever. In fact, I just did a trade with a buddy of mine to get a um, Black Cat poster that we're trying to figure out the year. It looks like it may have been from a re-release mm -hmm. um, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying to figure that. So if any listeners know anyone who's an expert on posters, let me know because I'm trying to figure it out. But um, one thing I want to go to, I, I kind of, uh, I know how you feel about some of this stuff, but um, this is a topic that's just going to be fun for the listeners. Uh, so as we moved into the 90s and early 2000s, uh, the creature feature eco-horror got kind of a small boom again with the straight-to-DVD market. You had things like, Python and Boa and Komodo and Shark Attack and, you know, just on and on and on. And, and I grew up on these movies because I would go and rent them all. I didn't care how bad they were. I didn't care how stupid they looked. 
if it, if it had a, a snake on it or a lizard or a shark, I would buy it. I remember the, one of the first uh, two DVDs I owned. One was an anime called Akira, which is amazing. The other one was a movie called Shark Hunter, which is about a, a guy that... Um, the, uh, there's a megalodon tree. It basically just rips off Steve Alton's Meg, uh, the novel, not the movie. Um, and for me, I, I really look back on on those really well. Um, and I know some of them have really bad CGI. Looking at you, Boa, but some of them have really amazing practical effects, like King Cobra, which was done by uh, the special effects were done by the Chiodos brothers. And you can see Mr. Miyagi versus a giant snake. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in this era, before we get to the insane, crazy CGI stuff that we'll get to next, uh, how do you? I know. I know you. You prefer your older uh, eagle horror creature features. How do you feel about this uh, section of it? Do you, like I? I kind of feel like a lot of them, while using. Uh, the the themes of you know science has made this and it's bad. They lose the message that eco horror was really coming with. It's really just using the excuse so they can throw a bunch of uh, monsters on screen. How how do you feel about this error? Um, just to sidestep, uh, you mentioned the Black Cat Eureka, the UK company, have just released a beautiful box set and um, the Black Cat's on it and. There's a bunch of amazing features, and I did a um, video essay on cats in horror films, so if you want to check that out, you should, if you love that film, if there's a new release coming out. Um, oh, your, your essay's on the re- Eureka release? Yeah, it's just, it's just coming. Oh, it's, I will definitely But you, you, you I already have to get... Go ahead. You'll love the whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of stuff on it, and it's got a... Um, two other films um, on that set. But yeah, it looks fantastic. They've done a really beautiful job on it. I will get that. I love my Scream Factor release. It has a great commentary on it. But mm-hmm. uh, Black Cat's one of those where I have to, any movie that comes out, even if it has one special feature that's different, <laughs> I have to own it. And I'm already going to order the Eureka um, double pack of the Toho science fiction classics, the H-Man, and uh, I believe Battle from Outer Space. I'm really getting it for the H-Man, because I love the H-Man. It has a great um, 60s uh, Japanese cop and mobster vibe to it, while also Mm -hmm. dealing with this science fiction element. I absolutely adore that movie. I'm a big fan of Yakuza films, especially from the 70s. Uh, the Battles uh, Without Honor Humanity series is a huge favorite of mine. So I'm looking forward to that. Eureka, you're doing good work, especially since you got my, my man Lee on it. That's what I'm talking about. Awesome. But now we, we yes. uh, so went from to an- sidestep and step straight into it. Sure. So my, my answer. So in the 90s, there's some really interesting works, especially in the early 90s. So if you look at even 1990 as a year, you have something like um, Sharkma, which... Um, is terrific. It's a, what a wonderful concept. A baboon who kills role play, you know, role playing nerds. Fantastic. Uh, with Roddy McDowell. So, and some beautiful special effects in that as well. Some great puppet work from the baboon. And I interviewed Christopher Atkins about it. And, you know, he shared some great stories. That interview's online. So, um, look it up. Uh, but also, um, speaking of Christopher Atkins, he did something like Beaks. Um, which is a killer bird film. In 1990, once again, you had something very mainstream. You have um, uh, Arachnophobia, which has Spielberg's name attached and Amblin attached. So, you know, ecological horror is still thriving um, in the mainstream. Uh, Then we have things like The Ghost in the Darkness, once again, a major film. And you have a whole bunch of things popping up during the 90s where animal horror is still, you know, a bankable... Um, Venture, Man's Best Friend, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of these different films. Then you get to the later 90s, and yeah, you're right, starts things like Lake Placid, Anaconda, uh, and all that sort of stuff, and then you finally get the, you know, films riddled with CGI, which look stupid, and just don't have any sort of, you know, weight to them aesthetically, or, you know, in, in other aspects. But there was a lot of under under 
um, uh, appreciated adventures that came out. One is Bats from the late 90s, which I actually really like, uh, with Lou Diamond Phillips. And it sort of is very similar, sort of similar to Nightwing, which is one of my favourites from 1979, a really subdued film from Arthur, um, Arthur Hiller, the director, um, who would follow up with something like Making Love with Harry Hamlin and Michael Ontekeen and Kate Jackson. But Arthur Hill is a really interesting director, and he made Nightwing, which was a, based on a novel, so it was a literary eco-horror film, and um, is a really interesting sort of uh, uh, scrutiny on race relations and the indigenous plight, and um, plays with really interesting tropes and has um, uh, really sort of dynamic uh interrelations between in varied indigenous characters which is really amazing it's great to watch because generally in american cinema during this you know that period in certain genres there'd be the one indigenous person this has like multiple indigenous characters of, of, of course nick mancuso is an italian and playing one but there's all these different indigenous characters who interact and have different political points of view which i really like it's like wow they're complex and not just one note it's really cool but Bats later um, employs a bit of the same sort of um, thing. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And there's, so there's a few. The Grey is a recent one that I actually really love. The Wolves with Liam Neeson. I loved that. I saw that the cinema and thought, fuck, this is really good because it's so bleak. <laughs> like I was like blown away by how bleak it was. I was like, this is just relentless and bleak. And the Wolves are fabulous and the, the, the mechanical work and that as well. I think there's very minimal CG in that. Um, but, yeah, I think all the sort of silly, like, snakes on the plane and all that sort of stuff just didn't do anything for me. I, I just, I, I get what they're trying to do, but I just feel like it's a little bit of a, a, a piss take and I don't really respect that. Um you know, I, 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 I get a bit cranky with, and people always sort of tease me about it. Actually, they kind of go, oh, "You take things too seriously, films too seriously." Well, it's like, well, fuck you. I love, I love movies, um, and there's this whole idea that people want to sort of play up this mystery science theater aspect to a lot of these things, and I'm just not into that. I never really want to laugh at movies. I think that's really, you know, I don't know. It's just not my thing. It's just the way I, I work. So it's funny sort of talking about this sort of stuff because, you know, you can't look at something like Sharknado and Trent seriously, of course not. So I'd rather not see it. Um, and I don't even want to see that as a comedy, you know. Um, so it's it's interesting. So that, that that's something that's sort of going for me um, as far as my argument of making this documentary is because, um, you know, if a studio was to say, oh, you know, you need to sort of talk about modern stuff, I, I will sort of say, no, I don't, because the modern stuff is not at all reflective of the subgenre, and it's pretty shit. <laughs> Besides some, exam some ex you know, um, exceptions, most of it's pretty fucking bad. So, you know, I, I haven't seen... There's been a few that people have sort of mentioned. There was, a, uh, I think, maybe a Korean film called Boar, about a killer pig. I haven't seen that. There was a, 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 a bear one that came out recently... Uh, but yeah, so there's all these new ones, but like any genre, uh, uh, new films, just I just don't watch them. And that's, you know, probably to my detriment as well, but in the same argument when, you know, someone says, oh, have you seen this? You'd love this. You should see this. I'd be like, well, yeah, have you seen this? And then, you know, <laughs> talk about some 40s film, you know, so it's, it goes both ways. So it's kind of interesting that water cooler conversation is always fucking about some contemporary film that you know oh you love it it's like mm, i don't know i probably won't um you should watch this old errol flynn film you know so it's yeah i don't know so to answer your question uh, there's some good in the night there's some great ones in the 90s um but after the late 90s when we're coming into the 2000s i really can't think of many besides Frozen and The Grey, they come to mind, and they're both wolves. Um, I can't think of many others, sorry. Yeah, there's, uh, and I'm going to point the blame to you, Shark Attack 3 Megalon, uh, Megalodon, uh, you and Sharktopus, which Sharktopus, let's just go ahead and say it, you ripped off an Italian film called Devilfish. Right. Let's not lie what you did. There. Which I love. I know what you did, I saw it. I'm on to you. Um, 
So they kind of really set into motion what would eventually happen with Sharknado, which I, I absolutely do not like. I do not like these... Uh, I call them stupid creature features where they're played for commentary labs. just so outrageous. I don't like that. Uh, we are starting to see a nice turn that hopefully continues with movies like The Shallows, 47 Meters Down. Crawl was a fantastic um, movie that, that came out. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully those serious um, creature features keep continuing. Uh, that that actually do fall into the eco horror subgenre, and we can kind of move away from the Sharknados and the uh, seven headed shark attack and avalanche shark and shark priest and all this this bullshit that I, I really fucking hate. Um, I'm with you on that. I fucking hate it. I'm not anti CGI because that's just the way the world works now, but. If your CGI looks like it should be on a PlayStation 2, and it's 2000, it's it's above 2015. You shouldn't be fucking doing it. It just yeah. it doesn't look good. The other thing I'm I want to sort of, yeah, the other thing I want to add is you mentioned Devilfish, which is so fun. It's a great film. Um, these same people, I don't know if there are people who champion things like you know Sharknado and stuff. Maybe just for you know, for a joke, but if they are actually seriously thinking these films are fun and great, they should go and watch a lot of these kind of European animal horror films because they're fucking nuts. If they were to watch something like Wild Beasts, they'd be blown away. Like, that movie is crazy. That's the one where the animals get on PCP and they go crazy and you have a polar bear going mad and, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of animals in that movie that's just insane. And also even like a made-for-TV movie called um, Beasts Are On The Streets which is where uh, there's a train um, accident um, and on the freeway, like a car accident in, in conjunction with a train. And all these circus animals come free. So you've got like a scene with a, this ostrich causing havoc and, you know, lions and bears fighting each other. Like it's crazy. So I think these people who sort of are watching this crap, these CGI riddled things, should go and watch these insane movies about animals attack. Like Raw, my God, from 81. Um, you know, Tippi Hedren and Noel Marshall and Melanie Griffith. You know, it's basically a snuff movie where lions are, you know, throwing humans around and there's blood everywhere and the blood's real. And, you know, um, uh, Melanie Griffith gets pinned down by a lioness and she's just ripping out her hair. Like, this is stuff that's real, you know. Um, so <laughs> I think this kind of thing is something that people sort of should go back and watch and, and maybe you know, see things from a different perspective because this contemporary stuff is just not that interesting and it's it's kind of, you know, a watered-down version of the fun exploitation films of the 70s. Yeah, I, I, our message here is say no <laughs> to Sharknado. Say yes to Up From The Depths. Yeah. If you want a bad creature feature for you to laugh for you to to riff for you to just sit back and enjoy the silliness at least go back to to the 80s where there was practical effects you know because that's always the worst practical effect is always going to be more entertaining to me than the 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 four joke bad cgi Mm -hmm. that's just how it is for me um so, you've mentioned a lot of eco horrors uh, throughout this entire uh, show, but I would like to have you recommend some eco horror for people who maybe want to now get into the genre. They've seen some stuff, but now they really want to like kind of see more out there. And I was hoping you could kind of recommend a wide array of, of eco horror. Maybe even like one or two from each of the subgenres of eco horror that you were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. so that people kind of have a good starting point of where they should go to really see what this genre is about. Okay, cool. Um, uh, for the one about sort of human uh, extent, animal extension of human, um, and sort of psychological sort of connection to animal. There's a great film called of unknown origin. 
which is basically this guy who's pretty much this yuppie, um, real f wanker. You know, if you don't know what wanker is, look it up. It's Australian colloquialism. But, but he lives um, in this kind of a lush apartment, this building, and he's, you know, obsessive and about money and about commerce and about good things. And basically this rat is living in is living in his his place and taking over and it's this war um and it's about his sort of emotional and mental um breakdown as he's fighting this this rat it's terrific um for the revenge fueled ego horror i would suggest we've mentioned orca in the pack <clears throat> actually you know what yeah i can't champion the pack anymore go the pack Get people to watch the pack. I'm, 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 and this is a really good ad for the pack. This whole con <laughs> this conversation. Um, Absolutely. Also, uh, real quick on your uh, Australian slang. Uh, following you on Facebook now, you keep using a word that I have. I've n I had never seen before. I'm not even exactly sure how to pronounce this, and I have to know. <laughs> D a r l s t s. <laughs> It's just, what is it? it's just like, I don't know. It's just dull. So it's like a darling or, or sweet, or, you know, just mate or friend, I guess. Anyway, let's move on. Um, th and that's not even an Australian thing. That's just me and my pals, my friends. Um, okay. uh, what are we on? Uh, okay. Um, science influence on horror, on eco. I would say, um, kingdom of the spiders, um, with William Shatner. Uh, because it's it's such a beautiful looking film, and it reads like a western. Um, and Shatner plays this sort of semi alcoholic, um, uh, sort of haunted by his brother's death in Vietnam, and he's got this kind of hangover relationship with um, his brother's widowed wife and her daughter. And he meets Tiffany Bowling, who's once again a sympathetic specialist, loves animals, is a specialist in spiders, etc. And they have this kind of interesting dynamic going on. And there's, you know, uh, conversations about second wave feminism thrown in there and alcoholism and, and environmentalism. And it's a really cool film. And it, and it sort of is subtly um, uh, presenting the, the use of pesticides. So it's not like, you know, endless fucking scenes of scientists talking about, you know, science. <laughs> it's just it's what it is. And also, it's a very bleak film. The ending is superb. Get that one. Um, and the character-driven one where a character comes in and influences the natural order, that's another really interesting topic. And that, I would say, I, I, I really love um, uh, Empire of the Ants. Um, and that's got a really cool, interesting um, juxtaposition between the John Collins character and the Queen Ant. And these two women, these two females, sort of fighting um, for dominance as to how to uh, manipulate and influence their army. Because Joan Collins plays the woman that's trying to get these people to buy condos. And so she's got this sort of power trip, which is fantastic. She's great to watch. And then there's this ant colony that's sort of, you know, building its own nest. Terrific. Um, and uh, the human help one, which is one of my favourite subgenres. I'm going to have to say Willard. I think it's just such a powerful film and such a gorgeous parable and i love um all the performers in that bruce davison sondra Locke, elsa lanchester ernest borgnine um you've got great elderly character actors in there um and it's just a really cool film about a poor guy who's just in a rut that has so much potential um but he you know is just oppressed by everything around him and having to live up to expectations and he finds solace in rats and he trains them. And yeah, it's a really lovely film. And also if you're, um, you know, I don't know if you've had pets in your life that were kind of, you know, unconventional, that one might appeal as well. But yeah, no, th so those, there you go. There's some options for people. There you go. You heard it from the man himself. Um, so also I kind of uh, want to allow you to tell people where they can hear your work what movies you've done comedy you don't have to list everything because you've oh. you, you you're uh are you almost at 40 or are you now over 40 for commentaries um over over nice so uh now are 
audience is obviously mostly horror, um, but you have done non-horror stuff, so please slip in, in some of those that are non-horror for the select audience that does get into that stuff. But um, what are some of the releases that have your commenter or have your essays or have your work on it that uh, you you would really like people to check out? Okay, I've just got a list here because I've got like a file of my, my notes. So I'm just, I'll reel some off. Um, so some I've done are um, the 30s Alice in Wonderland. I did Baby Blood, which is a gore film from 1990, a French film. Um, Berserk, which is a William Castle horror film with John Crawford. Um, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula, which was, you know, a, a fun film with John Carradine. Um, Black Moon Rising, which was um, based on a story by John Carpenter, um, uh, a cast-centric film with Linda Hamilton and Tommy Lee Jones. I did uh, recently films like Buccaneers Girl with Yvonne DiCarlo, The Cat and the Canary, the Bob um, Hope version. Uh, the Chicken Chronicles, which is a comedy with Steve Guttenberg. Uh, Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean, which is a Robert Altman film starring Cher and Sandy Dennis. Um, Country with Jessica Lang, Criss Cross with Burt Lancaster. Um, I worked on Cujo, the Eureka release, and that's got a lot of crap that I worked, uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff, like, so much stuff on it. Um, The Day After, um, uh, The Eagle and the Hawk, which is a war film with Frederick March. Uh, Endless Love, the Franco Zeffirelli film. Um, Flame of New Orleans, Marlena Dietrich, uh, Godspell, um, Grizzly, there you go, there's an animal one, Good Times with Sonny and Cher, which is a William Fridkin film, Homicidal, another William Castle movie, uh, In Search of Dracula, which is a documentary um, about Dracula, hosted by, or narrated by Christopher Lee, uh, Jenny, a Marlo Thomas film with Alan Alda, The Jericho Mile, which was Michael Mann's first film, uh, what else have I done? Link, there's an animal one. That's the one with the orangutan and the monkeys. Um, with Terence Stamp and Elizabeth Shue. Um, I'm really loving doing video essays. And I did one for Long Day Journey and Tonight. I did a video essay on um, movies based on stage works that were directed by Sidney Lumet. So in that I talked about things like Death Trap and um, The Wiz and The Offence and sort of tie them all up together thematically. That was really fun to do. Uh, Madam X, which is a Lana Turner film. Um, uh, Night of the Leapers, The Killer Rabbits. <laughs> um, Portrait in Black, another Lana Turner. Um, another animal movie that's not a horror movie called Ring of Bright Water. Um, bring tissues to that one. That's about an otter. It's really sweet, but sad. Um, oh, God, I've done quite a few... <laughs> Uh, Straight Jacket, once again, another William Castle with Joan Crawford. And another dog movie, Zoltan Hound of Dracula. I worked on that. But yeah, look, I've done quite a few, and that's some of them. <laughs> yeah, and well, I, one, you worked on Arrow's Carrie, right? Yes, 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 yes. So I know a lot of you people have that because you're huge Arrow fans. As am I. Arrow's one of my favorite companies. Um,. Yeah, so awesome, really. that's that's great, and, and we've already talked about some of the books you've done, uh, we talked about your documentary that's coming out, uh, everyone go buy Orca for his commentary from Scream Factory when it releases, but also just because Orca is a fantastic movie, don't listen to people that say it's a Jaws ripoff, it's not, it's its own film, and it's, it's absolutely glorious, it will make you feel feels <laughs> that you may not want to feel, but it's important to have those emotions so uh before we get out of here because i i do say we'll say you and i could talk for hours and hours but uh <laughs> you know we gotta leave room for a part two later on down the road maybe. Oh. so with that being said is there anything else you would like to say to the people a message you would like to give them before we get out of here yeah i I think my main thing is I think it's you're, you're all amazing to support physical media. It's really, really important. It's part of archiving film history um, and supporting, you know, people who work in, in the field. And it's not just, you know, the companies. It's 
producers and people who provide content and talent and people who actually, you know, work in factories making stuff. So it's like, you know, a good thing for, you know, industry. Secondly, um, I really, really want to sort of champion um, all film. I think um, a lot of people get stuck in to habits of just watching the same kind of stuff. Um, and that's really not good. Um, you know, it's really good to branch out. And instead of watching um, the same, you know, 80s horror film again, which is fine, it's awesome, try something else. You know, give a, a Western a go or a film noir or something else. So it just sort of broadens your filmic knowledge and, and appreciation of cinema. Um, also, you know, tap into different markets and and different eras and different types of film as well um uh you know embrace things that you're not comfortable with so get out of your comfort zones um what else i don't know i just think people sort of should just sort of enjoy more than what they do because i think they're sort of um i don't know <laughs> cheating themselves <laughs> i agree if you have not seen the maltese falcon you should be watching the maltese falcon it's one of the greatest movies ever made and a lot of people have not watched it because, you know, it being a, a, a much older black and white movie, you're really missing out. Well, There's that's ludicrous. So many... And so the thing is, with something like The Maltese Falcon, you've got all these wonderful connections. So one of my favorite things about that film, which is such an obvious film, I mean, that should be, you should have seen that when you're four. But, but one of my favorite things about that movie is the performance from Peter Lorre. And if you look at Peter Lorre's beautiful contribution to horror it is just fantastic there's a great film called mad love where he plays this demented scientist who uh, it's based on the story hands of orlack and it's just a terrific film this sort of tormented mad scientist who's in love with this woman um this actress and um she's in love with this pianist but the pianist loses his hands in an accident and then this scientist played by peter lorry gives him the hands of a murderer so he's sort of you know, she's terrified by her lover. Fabulous stuff. And then he was in this film called The Beast with Five Fingers, which is set in Italy, and it's this gorgeous, lavish, gothic horror film. But it does have a Scooby-Doo ending, which drives me crazy, but that's okay. And he did all these great films. M, which is where he plays the child um, killer. Chilling stuff. And he was a wonderful performer. And so you've got all these great connections. Um, and if you're talking about Maltese Falcon, you've got to check out Bogey's work. And one of my favorite films of Bogey, Humphrey Bogart, is a Western called Virginia City, where he plays an almost unrecognizable villain. He's got this weird mouthpiece and he goes, you know, toe to toe with, uh, Errol Flynn. And it's a terrific film. Wonderful film. Uh, Miriam Hopkins is in that as well. And then you go, oh yeah, Miriam Hopkins, she was you know, Champagne Ivy and Jekyll and Hyde, the fantastic pre-code Jekyll and Hyde with Frederick March. And so, you know, you've got all these just excellent things. I just think people need to, to branch out. It's cool to love Freddy, everyone. It's great to love fucking Jason, but there's other things. I completely agree. It's fine to stay, you know, everyone loves their comfort food, but every once in a while, you have to venture out. You have to eat something new. You have to at least check out this other stuff that's out there. Um, what I know people give me... Mm. What? One of my favorite quotes is from the late, great Vito Russo, a wonderful film critic and writer and historian and activist. He wrote The Celluloid Closet. He wrote... He did a, a lecture and he was talking about audiences and audience participation and he said... Um, uh, so many people, I think his lecture was just before he died. He died in 1990, I believe. So before that, he was doing this lecture and he did this lecture and I've got a bootleg of it. And it's fantastic. I think it comes on the Celluloid Closet documentary as an extra. But it was just when Batman had come out, the Tim Burton, and he says something like, you know, uh, instead of people going to see, you know, this film, this film, or this film, they're going to see Batman again and again and again. Um, and he goes... Um, there's nothing wrong with Disneyland. There's nothing wrong with experiencing Disneyland, but you'd be a fucking idiot if you wanted to live there. <laughs> and I remember that oh quote, God, yes. and I really like that quote because it's basically like, yeah, it's fine to do, to have that escapist, you know, blockbuster shit. That's great. It's fine. But you'd be an idiot if that's all you need or all you want because you're missing out. <laughs> 
you know. Agreed. Also, Danny Elfman, you're not slick. You stole the the theme song <laughs> for Tim Burton's Batman from 1941's The Wolfman. I know what you did. I saw it. Okay, you're not slick. <laughs> Some of us know. Yeah, it's in there. Okay. Huh? <laughs> but um, point that out. It's funny. Um, what, uh, my favorite Elfman actually is um. Batman Returns, I think that's a stunning score. That's a great film. But also I really liked his um, uh, work on Dick Tracy, which is a film that people ignore. But I really love Dick Tracy from 1990 because I think it's like one of the last really pure Hollywood films. Like it's got this fantastic cast. It's got great songs from Stephen Sondheim. It's got the beautiful matte paintings. It's got these great makeup designs. Um, The colour scheme. It's just this perfect kind of... Hollywood classicist film. I think it's terrific. I don't know why I'm talking about Dick Tracy, but yeah, I, I just, yeah. I have a feeling that fans of this show really like Dick Tracy, to be honest. Good. Um, <laughs> so that's completely okay in my book. Um, so with that, we are about to get out of here. Thank you, Lee, for, for taking time out of you. I think it's night for you taking time out of your night to hang out with me uh discussing ego ego horror please everyone check out the screen factory release of orca check out uh his books i will have links to his stuff in the description for you to check out so thank you lee it has been a blast i love talking to you i can't wait to talk to you more i uh i, I want to have you on many many times in the future uh, to go through multiple movies. In fact, I think it would be very interesting. I may have to do a show where you recommended me a, a non-horror movie, maybe like that Western you were just talking about with, with Humphrey Bogart, and I give it a first-time watch and see how I feel about cool. uh, stepping out of my comfort zone. Westerns are not a bit. I, I, I've watched some spaghetti Westerns, but I've not watched a lot of the classic era of Westerns. Mm-hmm. So that's a... Um, an area that I am lacking on, but I am one of those people that I like to make up that slack. I like to go out there and watch stuff. Um, so that could be something fun we could do in the future. So thank you for joining us. Everyone, go check out Lee's stuff. And we will see you next time here on Kill the Cast. If you've got any parting words, Lee, for the people, go ahead and drop your goodbye. <laughs> Just uh, if you want to jump on the Facebook uh, documentary page, and give it a like. That'd be great. <laughs> it will be in the description. Some of you have already done it because I shared it in the Kill the Cast Facebook group um, like a week or two ago. Some mm-hmm. of you have already done it. Uh, and I'm proud of you if you have done it already. But if you haven't and you're behind the curve, well, here's your chance. It'll be in the description. I'll even repost it when I, the day I post this episode. I'll repost it in Kill the Cast for all of you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jerry. It's been absolute fun. I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was such a blast. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next time on Kill the Cast.